Well, today we launch into this new series called I Can Relate. It is a, a, a series on relationships. And the story that I want to tell, there's so much in this story. Like, so I, I've had trouble trying to get everything out. So it's, if it's okay, I, I'm going to talk like a New Yorker today really fast. Are you awake enough to follow me? Can you stay with me if I go fast? Okay, good. Um, there's just so much here. And so I'm going to give you kind of this, there's a big narrative arc and then we're going to drop down to talk about some relational dynamics. So, that's, so if you'll follow me, if you wonder why I'm skipping it, it, the big arc, but we'll drop down, do some relationship stuff, back up to the big arc. Because there's this really beautiful narrative that's being told all through the story. And it's connected to a much larger story. But we also have the dynamic of beautiful relationships. So let's kick it off with a proverb. Because our, our part of our subtitle for the series is Practicing Proverbs. It's knowledge applied. If you just have knowledge... It doesn't get you anywhere. It's knowledge applied. So let's kick it out. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 3. Never let loyalty and kindness leave you. Tie them around your neck as a reminder and write them deep within your heart. This is a story about loyalty and kindness. It's a story about two women who lived during the Great Depression. Their anguish, their desperation, their relationship, their industry, their risk, and their blessing form the context and create the beauty of this story. On the surface, their lives might be considered forgettable. They seem relatively normal. They were not known for historic accomplishment or innovative technology or dramatic wealth. They're just normal women living through the circumstances of their lives in the Great Depression in the year 1140 B.C. As a matter of fact, there are much more seemingly dramatic moments that are happening all around them. These events are recorded in the Old Testament book called Judges. Massive drama. And yet, these two ladies show up. Who would ever write a story about them? Turns out, God would. Or at least he would inspire someone to record the events of their lives to teach us something, to inspire us. So this is a little tiny four-chapter book wedged into the drama of all these Old Testament events, and the book is called Ruth. Its historical setting is infused with epic battles, national rebellion, genocide, kings and warriors, villains and heroes. And yet in this little book, none of that gets any attention. I think on purpose. I believe God led his followers to wedge this story into the Old Testament to remind us of us. That most of us just see our lives as relatively normal lives. We are living life in the routine. Life comes and it goes. And we have our struggles and our tensions and our celebrations and our joys. Most of us are not kings and princesses. Most of us did not strap on a sword or don a tiara this morning. Perhaps a few of you, but not most of us. Most of us got up, those here in this room, those watching via live stream, that you probably just consider yourself a fairly normal person living a routine life. Naomi and Ruth certainly would fit this category. They had no idea how their decisions were setting the stage for all of history. Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. Here's the background for that. There's this group of people called the nation of Israel. They have this covenant blessing with God, which means that God has promised them that it's through these specific people he would actually send a Messiah, a son who would come and eventually rescue the world that the world would need rescuing, that he would rescue, and it would come through them, that there was something special about their heritage. And so there were specific rules on how they were to live and, and ways in which they were inter inter interact, and something that was meant to be preserved, in particular related to a bloodline, because the Son of God would eventually visit the planet through them, and he would restore them to all of his original intent. And so there were people outside of their culture who they often looked at as outsiders, 
And, and there was prejudice that went with that. There were a lot of, there were battles, and there's all kinds of things that happened in the way they looked at the outsiders. They were often, um, they often got, uh, they often misunderstood what God was saying to them about so outsiders, because God has this way of bringing the outsiders inside. And God has a way of redeeming all things. In this case, you've got a man, his name turns out is Elimelech. He's married to Naomi. There is no more bread. And there are a couple of beautiful kind of literary elements happening here. Bethlehem means house of bread. There's a famine. There is no more bread. He hears there's some bread in an adjoining country. They currently have a peace agreement because they're often warring with each other. But there's a peace agreement. So different culture, different set of rules, different gods, different people. He says, let's go there. At least I can feed my family. We'll pick it up from there. Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. He takes his family there, but he doesn't last. And she's left with her two sons. Well, they wind up marrying Moabite women. One named Orpah, which I like to call Oprah, and the other, what, you're thinking that anyway, so. <laughs> Let's just call her Oprah for the rest of the story. Just because it's fun. Um, one named Oprah, and the other Ruth. After they'd lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilion also died, and suddenly Naomi's left without her two sons and without her husbands. This is a story of loss, initially. It's a story framed in loss. Malon and Kilion. Now, first of all, those are not Hebrew names, and they're probably not even their actual names. It's probably a reference that speaks to who they were. In Naomi's life, it was death and destruction. So she goes off to a foreign land, and she experiences nothing but loss, grief, and pain. The only thing she's left with, all three of the most important men in her life are gone, and she's left with two daughters-in-law. When my own, now, uh, she, now, so this is Naomi's life. There's a lot of loss, a lot of grief, a lot of pain, but she gets news that back in her hometown, back across the border, the famine has gone away, and they're about to have a great harvest, and the bread is back, food is back. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she'd been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. And then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, hold on a second, I'm taking you to my home, and this is your home. Go back, each of you to your mother's home. And may the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. And then she kissed them goodbye and they wept aloud and said to her, we will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, no, return home my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons? Who, who would become your husbands? Return home my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then they birthed the sons, would you wait until they grew up? And this is part of a law that said the brother is supposed to marry um, the wife if there's a deceased, uh, if there's a deceased uh, relative. And so she's going, you're going to literally wait for them to hit, uh, hit puberty? Are you going to do she, She's just creating the dramatic outlook of their lives. It's much better for you. Yes, it will hurt me. You're all I have left. But it's better for you if you go home. You're still child-rearing years. Like, you, you have a shot. No, my daughters, it's more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand is turned against me. You hear in Naomi, I want you to hear this because we're talking, well, this is where we're going to, moments we're dropping down into relationships. There's this beautiful picture of detachment. I'm going to give you a couple, we're going to use the science of psychology and I'll give you a couple labels here. First is detachment. Spiritual writers write about this at, at length as well. She's detached. She loves them, but she's holding them loosely. If you've ever heard, if you love something, let it go, and the end will come back to you. It's this picture of going, hey, you're my only support, and I love you. Obviously, there's, there's, there's weeping about just the thought of being away from each other. But she's going, you got a better shot back home. So I release you. I let you go. And here's the deal. I don't know what's going on with God, but apparently he's against me. Now catch something in this. This is a lot like when you read the Psalms. This is a culture that's not afraid to speak out what they're feeling. This is a confession. God's mad at me. She's right now feeling the weight of being a victim of all this loss. But she's not afraid to speak it out. She's also not denying God. She's very much acknowledging God. But her perception is this is currently how God's treating her. 
She speaks that out. They weep again together. And then Oprah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye and went home. But Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. I mean, you just hear this with Naomi. She is looking out for Ruth's best interest. And then we have what I would say one of my favorite literary places in the whole Old Testament in Ruth's reply. And in Ruth's reply, hear this. This happens in Hebrew literature a lot. Someone's name or an opening dialogue sets the character arc for their, not just their personality, but kind of who they are. So when you hear this response, the literature, because you, you, you know, in any, any story, you, you, you miss all kinds of details, right? There's lots of days and hours and years not included. So they'll give you kind of a little foreshadow. This is what the person's like. So listen to Ruth, and you're getting a real great snapshot of her character. And don't forget that opening Proverbs where you used about love and loyalty. So Naomi says, look, I have you, your best interest in heart go back. Ruth replies... Don't urge, you, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Because where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. And your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so, so severely. It's like saying, I promise you, I swear to God, even if death separates you and me, I am with you. And when Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she let it go. She stopped urging her. Richard Rohr says this, people who know who they are find it the easiest to know who they aren't. There is in Ruth this sense of confidence in who she is. She's determined. Naomi, you have loved me beautifully and I am going to love you in return. It is this wonderful picture of loyalty in deep friendship. It's a picture of kindness for a grieving woman. Ruth could have easily said, you're not right, Naomi. <laughs> like, you know, by the way, Naomi's name means sweetness. We're gonna find out in just a minute, minute She's going to meet some of her old family and friends, and she's going to tell them, I'm changing my name to Bitter. <laughs> Let's be clear. Like, this is about the dialogue I'm about to get to. And Ruth could have been like, you know what? When I first met you, you were so sweet and pleasant, and now you're not right. Like, you're bitter. You're messed up. I, thank you for the release, because you need to go work things out. <laughs> Ruth does not say that. Ruth is essentially saying, in the time when you need me the most, I'm with you. I don't care where you go. I'm going with you. I'm going to be a part of your story because I love you. It is this wonderful, clear picture of unity. So the women went on until they came to Bethlehem. Again, so let's pay attention here. There's something going on. That Bethlehem. There's some foreshadowing happening here. Those of you who have been around the church any length of time, if you've ever heard the term Bethlehem again, just let that marinate a few. There's two really important people that are connected to this city. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them, and the women exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? She used to be pleasant. <laughs> it's been ten years. She's not the same. <laughs> Don't call me Naomi, she told them. <laughs> call me Mara, because the Almighty God has made my life bitter. Okay. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? Anybody else got something to say? So you have this very strong woman. She's clearly being direct with everybody. Now there's also an irony that sits behind her pain. She says, I went away full. She's referencing, she had these men in her life. And she said she came back empty that these men are gone. But when she left, she, her stomach actually was empty and now she's about to enter a season of harvest where her stomach's going to be full. She also left without a daughter-in-law, empty. She's now also been given the gift of a deep, beautiful love relationship. She can't see it yet, which is okay. She's speaking out how she's feeling. This is where she is. The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. And that's why she sees it. But notice again, she hasn't given up on God. She just, this is how she sees he's interacting with her. 
It's her frame of reference. But time will go by and her eyes will be open. So Naomi returned from Moab accompanied by Ruth the Moabite. Catch that phrase, by the way, because it comes up a lot in this story. We keep being reminded that Ruth is an outsider. She's not under the covenant. She's not supposed to be part of the lineage. She's an outsider, not included. Have you ever felt out, have you ever been somewhere where you felt like you were an outsider? Have you ever felt like a misfit? Have you ever gone to a party and you said to your friend or your husband or your wife, you're like, let's get out of here. These people are weird. And (laughs) it's not so much that the people are weird. Well, maybe they are too. But you just feel awkward because you feel like an outsider. Go to whatever that motion is when you have felt not included and this is totally Ruth. Just imagine the moment walking into this little village of Bethlehem, the Moabite, 10 years later, your mother-in-law has got some stuff going on inside. She's not pleasant anymore. Everybody's trying to figure out how to interact and you're the very clear outsider. So go to that emotion and that's Ruth. Last line here in that passage. So Naomi, Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barely harvest was just beginning. And I want you to catch that last phrase because it's there for a reason. Remember, Bethlehem means bread. There was a season of emptiness. This is beginning to be a season of fullness. Naomi can't see it. Ruth is just coming by faith. But they're actually both here they are in the gritty part of their circumstances. By the way, little, little book Ruth wedged into all the epic stories of judges and everything else. Here's their little world seen through their personal lenses, but the sovereignty of God is still at play. They're actually exactly where they're supposed to be. God is orchestrating a story in their lives, though they can't see it arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Yes, this is specific, a harvest is beginning, but there is something metaphorical. You guys just can't see what's really going on. That's what's being whispered over this text. There's foreshadowing about the fertility of Ruth and the goodness of God that's coming. I want to pause right there for just a second because this is where it's Mother's Day And when we start dropping into the circumstances of people's lives, we're talking about loss and these other things, this can be very hard. And uh, Lindsay, who's on staff with us, she prayed during our second gathering and she lost a child. Our first gathering, a friend of mine named Lauren got up and she dealt with (coughs) a life long, dealt with lifelong infertility. And, And if you're here today and you've got some real questions, it seems like God's hand is against you. You might be able to identify with that feeling that Naomi has. And I want you to hear that. There's no shame for the fact that you, 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 you have questions. You're wondering. And what I hope you'll discover is that there's also a real big narrative arc going on as well. There's the sovereignty of God. Lauren sent me an email this week reflecting something really beautiful happened in her life this week. And she was reflecting, we've known each other for a long time, on kind of this long story. And she said this, in the midst of my battle with infertility, I could, even, I could not even fathom a way God could redeem it. Couldn't see it. I remember during my third and final IVF cycle, while driving back and forth from Pensacola for shots and checkups and every other humbling procedure known to man, I would pass a church with Psalm 113 posted on their sign. I took this as my promise from God that this time... IVF would work. He made me pass that sign because he was going to come through this time. He didn't. I was devastated when IVF didn't take and I was done with God. He clearly didn't love me and I was going to go it alone. Eventually, I hit rock bottom and I surrendered my life back to him. Everything changed. The last seven years of my life have been more than I could have ever dreamed. This past Friday, I was named principal of Trinity Elementary School. God has delivered and continued to deliver on his promises. She got married to an amazing guy named Peter, has two incredible stepsons, 450 graduated Franklin High School seniors, because she worked in the Franklin school system for a while, and 450 Franklin High School sophomores, and now I will have over 800 elementary students. I have definitely been given children. (laughs) Maybe more than I can handle. God is so good. 
there's more going on than we can see. And we can't control it. And sometimes we can't even imagine what it could be. So Lauren said, I just can't, it couldn't even, I couldn't see a way out. I couldn't see how this could be redeemed. But I'm given my life. And what am I going to do with the relationships that are in front of me? The fabric woven into the relationship between Naomi and Ruth is that of deep love. Naomi has loved her daughter-in-law as well. And now in her time of desperation, she is loved unflinchingly by Ruth in return. And as they transplant back into Bethlehem, one name is hardly mentioned without the other. And they're, they're not attached in a codependency sort of way, but they're bonded in a love that is free. You see that in the first interaction with Naomi, and when you get to the back of the book, you're going to find that even more with Ruth. Now, we don't have time to get to the whole book. I wish we did because there's an amazing love story, but there are a lot of women's Bible studies about it. And if you're interested, <laughs> you can have one. It is a great love story, and I wish we had time for it. I'm going to get to the front end, though, the kind of the part that sets it up, because that still relates to kind of our focus today. This thing about relationship. I want to give you another psychological term, because these two ladies model it beautifully. It's differentiation. Differentiation is the ability to balance individuality and togetherness. I think last week or a few weeks ago, I reminded you, if you've ever been to a wedding, you've seen the unity candle. There's one candle lit for the bride, one candle lit for the groom, for their families. And then they come, they take the candles, they light one in the middle, and there's this unity candle. And they usually go, blow it out, and put them back. The problem with that is you're, the imagery is that of losing oneself. And suddenly Jerry Maguire comes to mind, and it's you complete me, and you have this like, oh, I guess I'm, like I lose myself into you. The, that's actually not how we're designed in relationships. We're not designed to go into this emotional, fu- emotional fusion. We're not meant to lose ourselves. So by the way, if you're engaged or you're, you're getting ready for a wedding, would you encourage people to say, hey, you light the unity candle, but just don't blow it out. Leave it lit, because you don't cease to be you. It sounds, if, you know, if you've ever been through a big breakup and you're like, I can't live without you, like that's really great for a love song. It's not great for a marriage. Like, we should write new long songs for marriages. Like, I'd really like to spend some time away from you right now. (laughs) Like, love songs for marriages. I love you, honey, get away from me. Like, that could be a great song. This is differentiation. Like, no, you have not become me. I need you to find you. Apparently, some of you are familiar with this. Um, (laughs) Now, I've got two sentences for you, and it's all the only time I have to spend here, so I packed a ton of these two sentences. So catch these two sentences, because they're very robust. It is learning the art of togetherness and intimacy in uh, in contrast to the tendency to extract meaning from the other person. That's my first sentence. All right, so the goal is to learn togetherness and intimacy rather than I'm going to suck you dry for my personal identity. And here's the other sentence. When we latch on to people, expecting them to function as our guide or booster rocket, we get mired in borrowed functioning, I'll go to that term, confusing intensity with intimacy. When we basically say, I can't make it without you. I need you to be my rocket fuel. I, you're the one who supports me. I need you to uh, give me a sense of identity. I can't function. Then you're going, I need to borrow your functioning to apply it to myself. Do you know what most people on the other side, well, they might be codependent, so they may not tell you this, but internally they're going, dear God, I can't function for you all the time. Learn how to make an egg. (laughs) But I don't know how to cook. Great, here's five bucks. Go to McDonald's, knock yourself out. But you got to cook for me. Like, hold on. I'm not your mother. Hold on. You're going to have to find yourself. It, sometimes it happens in the goofy little things like that, but it often happens in the much deeper places when you're struggling with your identity. You don't have a clear sense of self, and you go, I'm going to fuse into you, borrow your functioning to somehow stand on my own, and you lose yourself. 
I, Angie and I, were, I think I told you this example too, but I'm going to use it anyway. It's the last service. We've got a little time, right? Okay. So Angie, I don't know if I, if I told you this. If I haven't, I'm going to just tell it to you again. Angie and I did a marriage conference uh, a couple months ago, and in this conference, we, we did a thing we, where I asked everybody to stand up and get, give, give each other a hug. And we asked them to then observe what that experience was like. And we said, so we had, uh, give each other a hug, hold it for, you know, 30 seconds, whatever. All right, now stand back and each of you separate and just stand, feet firmly planted and look at me. We're both standing up there and we're kind of guiding them through this process. And we said, well, reflect back on the hug. Were you standing like this when you hugged? What was the hug like? And then we had them hug again and we said, we want you to hug each other again, but this time we want you to stand your ground like you be centered in you. And they had a dramatically different experience. And we asked them to give some reflection on it. And one of the guys, was, he just started crying. He said, when I hugged my wife, I put my body on her like this. where she ba- I basically draped over her. And I said, how does that mirror your life? And he said, completely. I overwhelm my wife. And then another guy, I was talking to him, and he said, my wife put all her weight on me and to the point that I couldn't stand up, so I leaned on the chair to hold us both up. <laughs> I was like, how does that mirror your life? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm a complete rescuer, and I, all I do is disproportionately take responsibility for everything. I'm completely enmeshed. I'm like, okay. Just the simple act of giving a hug. So do you realize it's a tendency for us to actually not do the work of knowing who we are. And again, sometimes like we get faulty stuff in pop culture and love songs and other things that make it sound like you complete me is a great thing. It's not. We have to find ourselves. These two ladies are this wonderful example. You see the strength of their individuality, but when they come together, you have togetherness and intimacy. Ruth chapter 2. Now there was a wealthy and influential man in Bethlehem named Boaz. Boaz, his mother, super interesting story. Don't have time, but I'll reference it at the end. So, so there's an influential man in Bethlehem named Boaz who's a relative of Naomi's husband, Elimelech. Well, this is interesting because he's kind of in the family. That's a good thing for this Jewish culture. One day, Ruth the Moabite, Ruth the outsider, says to Naomi, hey, um, I have an idea. I've been living in town long enough, I've put together a few things. Number one, that guy Boaz, he's a little old, but he's kind of cute. And, um, <laughs> and he's connected to our family, and there might be an opportunity. And I've also discovered that one of these Jewish laws is that when people are out harvesting, those who are poor, don't have much, can hang around in the background, and they can pick up the scraps for free, that's a thing. So she says, hey, I have an idea. Let me go out into the harvest fields and pick the stalks of grain left behind by anyone who's kind enough to let me do it. Naomi replies, all right, my daughter, go ahead. So Ruth went out to gather grain behind the harvesters. Now I'm going to give you the next verse. I love this verse, and I've added a... Um, another translation, a translation we might not normally use because it's a little King James-ish, but it's so fun, we need to use it because there's more going on in this line. And think quotation marks. As it happened, and her chance happeneth, (laughs) she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz. Fancy that. (laughs) The relative of her father-in-law, Elimelech. Tell mom I said happy Mother's Day. (laughs) Now listen to this line by Robert Alter. So here's a Hebrew commentator. It's very straight, but just listen to what's underneath it. He says, this is hardly an accident because that is precisely where she intended to go. (laughs) I love it. Ruth is crafty. She's like, hmm. And now, and catch this. This again, here's the commentator. He says, the peculiar formation may be meant to suggest that there is a concordance between human initiative and God's providence. Louis Pasteur says it a little differently. He says, chance favors only the prepared mind. So this is totally that story when you're like, I don't know, that girl's so lucky. She just seems to find guys everywhere. That's because she's happened to show up next to that guy at the bar and go, oh, I didn't know you were sitting here. 
Hi, nice to meet you. This is the principle of staying in motion. And I love it because that's what's happening here. I mean, it is really like per chance, and chance happeneth. <laughs> Proverbs 21.5, we get another little nod toward this. Good planning and hard work lead to prosperity. So uh, there's this beautiful picture where Ruth actually puts herself in a place where she might intersect with Boaz, and sure enough, it works. Boaz arrives and notices Ruth. And he pulls his former aside and he's like, hey, uh, who's that lady? And he's told that she's a foreigner and a hard worker. And turns out she's the one connected to that story everyone keeps talking about. She's the one who's been loyal to her mother-in-law. So Boaz goes out of his way to make things easy on Ruth. We pick up the passage. Boaz went over and said to Ruth, Listen, my daughter, it's kind of a paternal thing. Now that changes in time. And again, we don't have time for the love story, but he says, listen, my daughter, stay right here with us when you gather grain. Don't go to any other fields. In other words, hey, you know, um, stay here. Yeah, hang around. <laughs> don't go anywhere. <laughs> this is a nice place. Stay right behind the young women working in my field. Because they got it worked out. You're going to get tips and tricks from these ladies. They know how to get this stuff done. And he's, I mean, he's really he's kind of giving her like behind the curtain. Here's how to get the biggest bang for your buck. Here's how to get most of the food. See which part of the field they're harvesting and then just follow them. And by the way, I've warned the young men not to treat you roughly. There's a little bit of a like, um, I'll be your defender. And when you're thirsty... Help yourself to the water they've drawn from the well. Now, there's more going on right here too that I have to mention because you might be like, well, that's really nice. He wants her to stay hydrated. <laughs> um, yes, but this is tucked in here for a reason. I want you to catch this. If you grew up in church and you're familiar with some of the Old Testament stories, and we go back a couple generations, there was this guy named Abraham. He had a son named Isaac, and Isaac was supposed to go and find a wife. Isaac didn't go, but Abraham sent a servant, and the servant prayed, I don't know how I'm going to find her, so God, would you please let me identify the servants now in another country, a foreigner in another country, would you let me identify the one, the lady who goes to the well and brings water to me, the man? We now have, help yourself to the water that the men have drawn from the well. We have a reversal. In the first story, we hear of Abraham and Isaac, the father of a country. In this story, once again, we're just giving a little, giving a little foreshadowing. It's time to meet the mother of the country. We'll keep reading. Ruth fell at his knees and thanked him warmly. What have I done to deserve such kindness, she asked, other than chance that happeneth. <laughs> <laughs> I am only a foreigner. Why would you show this kind of kindness on me? Yes, I know, Boaz replied. But I also know about everything you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. And I've heard how you left your father and mother and your own land to live here among complete strangers. May the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge, reward you fully for what you have done. And now we have the turn. This was a story of famine and a story of loss. And the story start as we got to Bethlehem, we could tell something was changing. And now we have now this promise and this hope and this trajectory now of fertility and fullness and love and a return home. It's interesting in the text when it says that Naomi is returning home, it actually says that Ruth is returning home. There's this return to home, even though it's not Ruth's home and we keep hearing that Ruth is a foreigner. Here's the narrative arc of all of scripture that we're hearing. Abraham was told, I want you to leave your home and go to a promised land. Ruth Leave your home and go to a place of bread. Jesus, I've gone to prepare a place for you. You are aliens and strangers in this world. Please recognize you're created for another home. It's called the kingdom of God. The great arc for all of us is that we are lost in this what we call home and are actually meant to find our true home. It's the great narrative arc of the whole Old Testament and it becomes the central teachings of Jesus. Ruth is yet again one of these people who lives out a paradox. 
This is not her home, and yet it's her home. G.K. Chesterton is famous for saying, paradox is truth standing on her head to get our attention. Every time you get to a paradox, it's truth going, <whistles> pay attention. Whenever you get to a thing like, wait, she's a foreigner and she's home, that doesn't make sense. Pay attention because there's a truth in that. The founding father of this nation, Abraham, left home to find home. And now the founding mother of this nation has done the same. And one day the Son of God would leave home to awaken us to our true home. Boaz, sorry, spoiler alert, <coughs> marries Ruth. Again, lovely love story. Enjoy it some other time. I don't have time. But Boaz marries Ruth and is in this story the Christ figure. And I want this one stay in the beautiful illustration of God and us, that's good, but I also want you to watch one more relational exchange that's very important. Boaz shows kindness and resources, Boaz shows kindness and then he resources Ruth all the while preserving her dignity. See what he doesn't do. He doesn't overwhelm her. He doesn't fuse with her. He doesn't give her a handout. He doesn't take away her contribution to her family or her capacity for work or her ability to choose. He recognizes her as a woman of dignity. Her needs didn't go away. He didn't remove all the tension. He just chose to be her defender and then guided her toward resource. This is a beautiful relationship. I gotta tell you, there are a lot of times when I pray, I pray for borrowed functioning. I go, God, I got a list of things. Currently creating tension in my life. I'd like you to be my personal, valuable assistant. I've knocked a couple of those off on my own. I got two I can't get around. I'd like you to fix those. I'm going to pray consistently. I might even write it down. Because <laughs> I'm going to remember and tell somebody you answered prayer. These two things, really obnoxious, like them to go away. I might get frustrated with you because I have a timeline. But you are my personal valuable assistant. I'd like to borrow functioning from you so that I can live my Jamie designed life. Borrowed functioning, not healthy. Because you know what I want to live a life toward ultimately my default is three idols. Comfort, power, and approval. I'd like to be comfortable. I'd like to be in control, and I'd like everyone to love me. <laughs> if you can make those three things work, my idols and I, we can take care of the rest. <laughs> when Jesus came and said, you have to be born again, this is what he's talking about. The brokenness of our flesh will always go to these three idols and just dumb down, to be, dumb down God to be a little personal assistant. God has a way bigger story going on. A way bigger plan. There's so much more. And so a lot of times when we go to God and I say, hey, I'd just like you to soothe my anxiety. Meet me at my point of need. I got some idols I got to deal with. And he goes, no, I'm actually going to make it a little worse. Well, what kind of God are you? One who loves you because you can't see it. Because this is a tiny little life and it's an anemic little story. And I've got something way more robust in mind for you. So I invite you, son, to come back into alignment with me. I invite you back into relationship with me. Stop using me as an assistant. Stop treating me as, this, as, as I am less than. And praise me anyway. Worship me. This isn't because God needs us. Sometimes I grew up like worship, like, oh, God's got a bit of an ego thing. I guess he needs us to praise him all the time. I guess his love language is affirmation. Um, <laughs> like... It's not that God's in need. He's God. He's okay. It's when I praise him, I'm reframing my relationship. I stop seeing him as this tiny little idol that can, I can use, and I go, oh, wait, you're the great big God. And I'm acknowledging that you know more than me. And I don't want to live into my little story. I want to live into yours. So give me eyes to see where you're moving, what you're doing, where you're at play, and let me join you in the grand story. If this tension is supposed to be here, 
I'm meant to live with this loss, I'll live with this loss. If this is a season of abundance, then let me be a good steward with the abundance. But you have not taken away my responsibility. I am meant to show up as a steward. I am meant to stay in motion, but I am also meant to trust you. I've mentioned Viktor Frankl last week. Let me reference him again. He says this, stop asking about what you expect from the world and start asking what the world expects from you. You're unbelievable. You're incredible. You're unique. You have a God design upon your life. Genetically, that nature and the nurture, your story, both of those things together make you unique. There's no one else like you on the planet and you are meant to reflect the love of God in your way. There is a God design. So maybe stop going, God, how come you're not making my life plan work and instead go, oh, what does the world need me to be? Who does the world need to be? Like, because I'm probably supposed to be that because that's the way I'm going to best reflect the love of God and experience close intimacy with him and shine the light for the rest of the world to, this, to be invited to the same thing. Otherwise, I live a tiny little life lost in my victimization and blame or my egoic life plowing ahead to, pushing the distractions aside, and I miss the fact that there is so much more at play. Here's what I want you to catch. This story is a really gritty story, lost in the details of like, like towns and, and grain and bread and sheaves, and later on you get to a place where the people, Ruth at the feet of Boaz, bedrooms, and it's like there's all this detail. But here, if you zoom the lens out, because the Bible does this for us. Boaz marries Ruth, and Ruth has a son named Obed. He has a son named Jesse. And Jesse has eight sons. The youngest of these boys is a ruddy, handsome singer-songwriter who joins the military, special forces. This is Ruth's grandson. It's her great-grandson. This guy lives an interesting life. He faces a giant and kills him. That's the short version. Because we don't have time. He eventually becomes the king of an entire nation. Her great-grandson, her boy, becomes the king. His name is David. She is a great-great-grandson. He's a smart guy. His name is Solomon. Happens to be the wisest man to ever walk the planet. And Ruth gets a new mother-in-law. This lady, she was an outsider too. She wasn't a Jew. She grew up in an urban environment. She made a great deal of money as a high-priced escort. In Jericho, the walls fell down. Her name was Rahab. God is in the habit of bringing the outsiders inside. You are never too far gone to be loved and included by God. No matter the lies that tell you you don't belong, the shame that comes up and says you're not good enough, the peace that says you're a misfit, you can't possibly belong to the body of Christ because you just don't see the world the same way. Can I just tell you, God's in the business of including exactly you. He doesn't strip you of your responsibility or stewardship. He doesn't remove the dignity of choice. He leaves that with you all the while choosing to be your defender and your source. He's inviting us all to a promised land. It's called the kingdom of God. Would you pray with me? Would you close your eyes, bow your heads, or stare at the ground, whatever helps you focus, a reflection before we sing this song over you. I 
I can't wait for the moment on the other side, whatever the other side is, the other side of death, to hear stories from Ruth. Who just would have seen herself as living a normal, insignificant life. She was grafted in. She was included. <laughs> there was another person who came from her now hometown. Born there, as a matter of fact. His name is Jesus. Yeah, she got to be involved. Included in giving birth to God. God redeems all things. If there's anything inside you right now that's just heavy, bitter, confused, discouraged, can I just remind you there's no shame. You have been, you already are loved. Would you just ask God to give you ears to hear and eyes to see. Maybe give you a glimpse of the bigger story. Would you place your hope in him? Consider what it might be like in those relationships close by to just be you. To find strength in him. To stand on your own two feet. Trust that he can empower you. Give you the confidence you need to make it through today. This song is our prayer. We sing it over you. And just join us as the Spirit leads. Oh.